you. Um, yes, uh, so I will talk about rock art biographies, uh, the contribution of digital imaging technologies uh, to this um, topic. And, um, well, the main underlying aim of, um, of this paper is to demonstrate how the theoretically informed application of digital imaging technologies has the potential to greatly contribute to our understanding of rock art, particularly uh, engraved rock <coughs> art. So formal approaches to rock art have traditionally focused on meaning and representation. Rock art images panel and panels were held as static representations of symbolic frameworks, while their materiality and active role in cultural production were overlooked. Typically, as this example from Northwest Iberia shows, rock art panels and motifs were recorded and rendered two dimensionally, with little or no indication of topography, texture, or possible sequences of making. Furthermore, in the case of petroglyphs, these archaeological representations frequently made no differentiation between marks that were evidence of differing carving techniques. The main aim of such recordings was to extract key information about form in order to identify types, styles, patterns, which would then be interpreted in terms of a variety of symbolic frameworks, such as identity, ideology, or cosmology. But as rock art research developed during the last two decades has revealed, the outline and spatial patterning of rock art motifs are just fractions of much broader and more complex multidimensional phenomena. Now we know, for example, that the microtopography of the rock surface played key roles in processes of rock art production. That rather frequently, rock art panels were the product of various interventions. And that as recent research has highlighted, rock carving techniques and technologies need to be studied systematically to tackle key social dimensions of rock art. So during the last 10 years or so, we have been experiencing an authentic digital, digital revolution. Digital technologies are becoming more accessible than ever before, not only in terms of portability, price and knowledge needed for their implementation, but also in terms of dissemination of outputs. For rock art specifically, techniques such as reflectance transformation imaging, image-based 3D modeling, and multispectral imaging, which nowadays can be applied within low-cost budgets with DSLRs and open source or fairly cheap software, offer huge potential to explore innovative research venues. Still, the most common, if not unique, use of 3D modeling in engraved rock art research, for example, is aimed at detecting and rendering the outline of carved, carved motifs. Namely, in general, the application of digital imaging technologies is still framed within traditional paradigms and research questions. But much more can be done with these accessible technologies. The analysis of surface texture, for example, can provide key information to interpret carving techniques or sequences of manufacture. During the last few years, I've been conducting research on rock art within a framework that could be broadly labeled relational, uh, biographical, since it attends to the life histories of rock art panels, taking into account the mediation of diverse entities, including the rocks themselves, which could have an important role in the crafting of unexpected outcomes. This was clearly exposed by recent replication experiments that I conducted with students from Cardiff and Southampton universities. In one of these experiments, two teams of students with no previous experience in rock art carving were equipped with the same set of sets of tools and two different boulders on, of the same type of stone, mica schist, uh, were asked to carve the same iconographic composition. The resulting rock art productions were fairly similar in many respects to the rock art they were intended to imitate, being the main differences between them, those resulting from the differing structures of the individual stone boulders. These experiments underlined the importance of attending to the specific properties of individual rocks in conjunction with the skill of the carver and the role of their interaction in rock art making. The biographical approach has great potential for addressing the social and historical dimensions of prehistoric rock art, this concept should also include the chaîne opératoire involved in, their, in rock art production, understood as the identification of the sequence of steps or actions 
involved in <coughs> its production, from obtaining the raw material to its manufacture, primary and secondary uses. Additionally, considering the durability and landscape dimension of rock art, the various natural and anthropo anthropogenic post-depositional processes, including their eventual reuse, transformation, the effects of erosion or agricultural activities that have been contributed to its present state are taken into account. So the case study I discuss here are the so-called warrior stele, found across Western Iberia and Southern Iberia and dated to the late Bronze Age and early Iron Age, roughly between uh, 1400, 1250 up to the 8th century Pal BC. Warrior stele are carefully shaped slabs measuring between 60 and 160 centimeters in length, decorated on one of their sides. Their iconography revolves around the representation of a warrior persona through the patterned combination of a range of carved motifs. Human bodies, headgear, personal attributes, weapons, chariots with horses, dogs, mirrors, weight looms, combs, and or lyres. Most of the stele depict what appears to be the body of a personage surrounded by a panoply of weapons, perhaps great goods of a deceased, deceased person. Although in few occasions, they also include more than one human body and even not narrative scenes. When analyzing the formal variability of stele, a typical starting point has been the analysis of the co-variation of iconographic motifs and to a lesser extent, specific conventions such as the position of motifs in relation to each other. The most widely accepted classification is based on the joint presence of a sword, shield, and spear. That is the basic panoply, type B. See box to the left. Um, these images uh, were published by Harrison in 2004, which appears uh, alongside other motifs uh, in type called B plus O or type 2B. And then um, type A, so that's the box to the right, would include varying numbers of the aforementioned objects along with a schematic human figure or more than one human figure. These three major groups present um, or have super-regional distributions that differ but do, or however, overlap. The development, like geographic and temporal, of these iconographies has been linked to networks of social interaction during the late Bronze Age and early Iron Age. While type B, so the simpler one, appears to be the oldest, all types, all three types, seem to, be, to develop simultaneously from the 12th century to the 10th century BCE. However, only type A, so the one to your right, seems to have continued until the early Iron Age. The results of a recent analysis of a sample of 95 well-preserved stele by means of correspondence analysis are consistent with the chronological de development proposed for each of the aforementioned types of stele. However, correspondence analysis produces two dimensions which only account for 40% uh, of the total variance, a percentage which increases to 51% if we include the third dimension. The distribution of cases and variables could be indicating the gradual increase in the iconographic vocabulary available over time from B uh, towards A to the, I mean here, from B, which has the main uh, elements of the basic panoply, which is to your right, towards the left. So different elements. Um, yeah, up here, here, like the dog, the brooch, palm, bow. This would be in line with the generally accepted idea that these steely represent objects, or knowledge of them, which circulated via networks of social interaction. Regarding formal conventions, some seem to be restricted to specific regions, while others are distributed across wide regions. To sum up, the formal analysis of the motifs, motifs portrayed on warrior steely allow us to put their production within the framework of inter-regional interaction networks during the late Bronze Age and early Iron Age. However, there is still much variability among uh, stele that remains to be explained. Additionally, even though stele were traditionally approached as finished art artworks, there are cases that were clearly carved in more than one intervention. 
The recent reappraisal of other stili is revealing that recarving and reworking was more pervasive than previously thought. So given that stili are part of a restricted, well-defined tradition, they offer a good opportunity to explore issues of variability and temporality in rock art making. While formal commonalities among stili can be explained through social interaction, how can we understand their differences? Were these crafted through the subsequent modification of stili? Can be formal differences linked to differing technological styles? In order to address these questions, a series of warrior stili from southern Iberia have been reanalyzed by means of digital imaging technologies. So uh, we applied 3D modeling, laser scanning and photogrammetry, and RTI. These are stili, the stili of Almada de la Plata, made of local tuff here, published by García San Juan and colleagues in 2006. The stili of Setefilla, probably of limestone, studied by various scholars in the 20s, that one there. Um, uh, in the 20s, in the 60s, by Almagro Bash, and then in the, in the early 2000s by Celestino. The Stella of Mirasiviena, so that's the one towards the, the far right, uh, made of local mica schist, uh, recently discovered and studied, and the study is uh, currently under review. And the Stella of Almarken, uh, make, made of local dolomite, uh, published by uh, Villa Secaria in the 90s which is this one. So the petrographic analysis of this stella, uh, stili has been done uh, by us, or by, uh, by me in conjunction, working together with García San Juan. Um, and yes, with a broader team of uh, specialists, we have conducted the reappraisal of the stili and their fine spots. So the stili had been studied previously, uh, had been approached from a traditional perspective that treated them as two-dimensional finished uh, products and did not examine in depth uh, with appropriate technologies uh, the techniques used to carve them. The aim of this new study was to examine them from a biographical point of view, including the chaîne opératoire of their manufacture as well as the possible overlays of motifs or su subsequent modifications. And as you can see here, uh, of course, they didn't have, uh, I mean, these technologies that we're using nowadays were not available in the 20s, 60s. <coughs> so you see, for example, that in the case of Cetefilla, uh, different renderings of the iconography were produced. And some even, uh, well, they differ in some uh, key details. And, um, well, at least two of them didn't pay much attention to uh, the volume of the stone uh, and many other details. So from the digital techniques employed, RTI was particularly useful for the analysis of stella making marks, thanks to its capability to render surface detail with very high resolution. In the case shown here, this is a fragment of the studio of Mia Siviene, we can see various snapshots. So this is one, uh, this is the default image. And here you can see uh, when you apply the specular enhancement, probably you're already all familiar with RTI you can get a very, very good reading of the surface. Uh, so the first is snapshot of the default view without transformation. The second and third are two peaks taken with a specular enhancement filter, which reveals, uh, sorry, which reveals several marks linked to the preparation and carving of the steel. Particularly interesting is a series of fine parallel groups produced through the pre preparation leveling of the surface in the area of the shield. And I can see uh, the very fine groups. <coughs> um, yes, so 3D models with submillimeter sub uh, accuracy were produced for all steely, and this geometric documentation was used as a complement to the observations made through the qualitative assessment made by means of RTI. Nevertheless, most of the details of manufacture were better visualized uh, via RTI. So RTI analysis of this four stili not only revealed details of their manufacture, but also allowed comparison between them. Here we can see various snapshots showing some relevant details of the stili. So you have them in different columns. Column A is Almaden, Column B is Setefilla, Mira Sevilla is the third one, and then the further to the right is Alma, uh, Almarjan. 
So in the first row, um, you see details of soil phase preparation. For example, the soil phase of the stili uh, of Almaden de la Plata was leveled through chiseling, and you can see the small marks uh, quite well. And they are not readily visible when you see the stili um, directly. And this is a very way to document them, at least uh, visually. While the Stella of Mirasibiene was leveled through abrasion. So that's the third one, where you can see the very fine grooves uh, of the abrasion that was um, yeah, uh, applied to level the surface, to smooth it. So in the second row, you can see details of the grooves depicting the shields, for example. The shield of Almaden, in this uh, end, was depicted through fine incision, while those outlining the shield of the Estela of Mirasibiena have deeper U, uh, U profile with a smooth surface made through pecking and abrading. In the last row, uh, you see details of the groups depicting the human figures. Each fi uh, human figure shows distinctive formal and technological traits. The figure of Almaden is outlined through incision, while that on Sedefilla is delineated through shallow pecking. The differences between the TD of Mirasibiena and Sedefilla, found very close to each other, just barely two kilometers, okay, and depicting similar compositions, are stark. Overall, what we could see, I don't know if you can see this, yeah, uh, that an important step in the process of stella making was the preparation of the surface. In all cases, considerable time was spent in leveling the surface, although the finish varied from one stella to another. And these drawings that I'm showing here, they are not intended to be realistic representations of the stili, so they are just intended to be synthetic interpretations. So we usually, when we publish this, we publish these uh, synthetic interpretations with images from 3D model or RTI, or even if the publication, the publisher allows us, we would upload the 3D model. And here is the other one. So this is intended to, uh, sorry, I just lost my head. I'm just finishing, so. Uh, I just have two more slides. This one and another one. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so the carving techniques employed to depict the different motifs were also varied. In Almaden, fine incision and abrasion were employed in this one. While in Stili, like Sedefilla, the second one, the groups were produced through shallow pegging. A more elaborate finish is that shown by the groups of Minas y Viena, which is the third, the third one. It is difficult to discern the sequence followed to carve the different motifs, since there are just a few clear superimpositions. Uh, but in the case of Almarken, which is the last one, the fact that the human figure's shape is slightly adapted to the shield's curvature indicates that maybe the shield was probably, like, possibly carved before. Furthermore, the Stella of Almaden and Minas Viena show more complex biographies. In Almaden, some small cup marks, possibly produced through surface preparation, were incorporated in the stili iconography. One as a possible bracelet, this one here, and another one here as part of the, of the sword, uh, as the pommel. So while at a later stage, the two hands that were originally touching uh, were probably intentionally, intentionally erased. So here we recreated the hands, but actually there is a, a play exactly uh, here in the middle. The Stella of Minas Ibien is more difficult to interpret. There are a couple of upside down quadrupeds in the lower uh, section, and some unfinished motifs in the lower part of the stone, which could have existing, ha, could have been existing carvings. Additionally, the human figure appears to have been carved over an existing, existing motif, possibly the depiction of a blade or something similar. So you see the human figure of Minas Ibien has a very weird um, ending in the lower part. But the problem is that the groups are so very well abraded that you cannot really see, distinguish what cuts what. So to finish, I refinish. <laughs> These details are highly relevant since even though there are formal similarities between the stili that can be interpreted as a result of the immersion of these communities in broader network uh, interaction networks, each stella represents, uh, presents clear ID crisis particularly in the way they were made. The style in which the same categories of motifs are depicted in each of these stili, as well as their technical qualities and the sequence of carving followed to decorate each slab, differ notably from one another. 
a fact that is even more striking when we consider that all of them were documented in the Guadalquivir Valley. This underlines the significance of the local di dimension of this monument, and in that their crafting was probably in the hands of local artisans who likely had limited experience in stella making and or implemented carving techniques uh, known in local regional rock art traditions. This suggests that despite the use of a widely shared graphic language, there was no single way of making warrior stealing. This has relevant implications when interpreting the social and ideological dimensions of these monuments. Importantly, petrographic analysis indicate that the slabs used to manufacture them uh, were locally sourced. So further suggesting that stella making was broadly shared, but of course locally executed practice. Thank you.